I know there, in Putin's early years, he was growing up, he was a kid, he was a brawler who liked to fight. And I read the testimony of his friends who said that when he fought, he fought with his fists, he fought with his teeth, he tore out the hair. Russians are changeable. And uh, so maybe that means after a war in Ukraine, which seems to be a defeat, they will reassess the question of how much they support an authoritarian regime like Putin's. <laughs> My name is Michael Ziger. Every week I'm speaking to the unique guests, and today I'm going to interview William Taubman, the famous uh, American writer and scholar um, who is well known for his biographies of Nikita Khrushchev and Mikhail Gorbachev. Um, hello, Professor Taubman. It's great to see you. Um, as you are best known in the world for uh, two brilliant biographies of uh, two Russian leaders, Soviet leaders, who tried to reform Russia, Nikita Khrushchev and Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, we, we know that uh, both those books were um, mostly devoted to one very important uh, topic. Is it, is it possible to reform Russia? Uh, so it stops to be the, the evil empire. What, what's your take on that? Well, Khrushchev and Gorbachev both failed. Uh, Gorbachev went much farther than Khrushchev, but Khrushchev was ousted, as we all know, and so in effect was Gorbachev. So uh, at least as far as their cases are concerned, it proved very difficult and in the end impossible to finally reform Russia or the Soviet Union. Uh, now, the question of whether post-Soviet Russia, the Russia we know today can be reformed, is not quite the same question because it's a different country. Uh, the republics are gone. The constituent Soviet republics are gone. The Communist Party is gone. Uh, the uh, Democrats who pressured Gorbachev to go farther and faster, uh, have been repressed to the extent they still exist. Um, so I would say it's more difficult now than it was then. <clears throat> I would add one other thing. Mm -hmm. Both Khrushchev and Gorbachev, as general secretaries of the Communist Party, had great power, the power not only to repress, but to reform. Uh, at the moment, Putin, of course, has great power, but he is certainly not interested in reform. So to imagine a reform that succeeds in fundamentally changing Russia, we need to imagine a new leader with great power um, succeeding where Khrushchev and Gorbachev failed. Success. Now, maybe, now, of course, in the case of Gorbachev, uh, that reform came from the top, and it was met for a while with great support from below, from people who wanted change and reform. But as we know, many of those people became disenchanted with Gorbachev and decided that he was, in the end, an ally of the hardliners who wanted to resist change. So we would need to imagine, again, a, a wave of pressure from below, joining with a new leader at the top to push reform farther than it was able to go under either Khrushchev or Gorbachev. Yeah, that's, that's a difficult task. Uh, when you were writing a book about Gorbachev and the collapse of the Soviet Union, could you imagine that uh, uh, that collapse hasn't happened yet, and that actually the, the most uh, um, 
the most bloody consequence of that uh, process is yet to come. And uh, do, do you consider the war in Ukraine uh, to be like the, the new part of that uh, long-lasting collapse of the Soviet Empire? Well, you know, I when I was writing the book about Gorbachev, I interviewed him uh, many times at great length. And in some of those discussions, he himself uh, was seemed to be debating with himself as to whether he had gone too fast or too slow to reform the Soviet Union. In the beginning, I got the impression he thought he had gone too slowly. He should have pushed sooner and harder and faster. But later, I got the impression he concluded he had gone too fast. And I read one of his speeches or one of his comments at one point. He said, it will take decades, even the entire 21st century, for democracy to come to Russia. So <clears throat> I guess it's beginning to look as if he was right when he said he had gone too fast, that it will take decades. At least that's the way it looks to me from outside. Yeah, but actually, uh, these are, um, I think, th these are two different phenomena and two, uh, and two d different processes. Uh, first, democracy coming to Russia. That's uh, all of us were sure that it's going to take time to, to happen. But at the same time, the war and like Russian uh, invasion to Ukraine, that was um, not expected by many or probably by the majority of uh, the experts, of the politicians, of the writers, and even by Gorbachev himself. Um... Yes, that's true. Uh, and I'd like to talk a bit more about why it happened when we did not expect it. Yeah. But on, on their question itself, I guess the issue is what will be the effect of the war in Russia? You know, we have two other big wars and, and some small wars in the past to look at. World War I created or, or at least catalyzed the revolution. Uh, World War II, uh, of course, was depicted as, and it was in a way, a great victory. So it was used by the regime to strengthen itself. The war in Afghanistan shook the regime uh, and contributed to the pressure for reform. So the question then becomes, what will be the effect <clears throat> of this war? Uh, if it turns out to be a clear defeat for Putin and for Russia, then, then the question is, who will benefit from that? On the one hand, we have the nationalists, the, the right wing, the patriots who were pushing uh, to show that the war was a failure of Putin's regime and that they will be harder and rougher and tougher. Uh, on the other hand, there are obviously all the people who have tried to protest and many of whom have left Russia who would like to see the reform become the catalyst for de democratic reform. So I, I'm afraid <laughs> I don't know a defeat which what will be the effect of a defeat? But there's a prior question. Will there be a defeat? And although at the moment it doesn't look good for Russia and Putin, uh, I think it's too soon to be sure. And the thing that worries me most, as it does many people, is whether Putin will attempt to prevent a defeat by any means possible, including the use of a nuclear weapon. Mm, do you think that's possible? Well, you know, I did not, like you, I did not expect the Ukrainian invasion itself. Uh, like a lot of people, I thought he was bluffing. I thought all those troops on the border of Ukraine were part of a big pressure campaign, but there would be no invasion. Once he invaded, it changed my view of Putin. Mm -hmm. It showed... <clears throat> It showed that a man who I had thought to be uh, cautious and calculating was actually wild and reckless. And that made me think 
that faced with defeat, he might do something wild and reckless like using a nuclear weapon. And if, if you'll permit me, I, I would like to talk a little bit about Putin himself in, the, in this regard. You know, when I studied and wrote about Khrushchev and Gorbachev, I was interested in their personality, their character as best I could understand it. And I came to the conclusion that both of them had two important characteristics. One, they had great power, and two, they were unique. What do I mean by unique? They did things that no one else in their circle would have done. In Khrushchev's case, it was the attack, the denunciation of Stalin, and it was putting missiles in Cuba. I don't think any of his Politburo colleagues would have done either of those things, with the exception of Beria, but he was gone by then, executed. In case of Gorbachev, <clears throat> he tried to democratize, to transform the Soviet Union. Nobody else in his circle, in the Politburo, would have done that, with the possible exception of Alexander Yakovlev and Eduard Shevardnadze. But the only reason they were in a position to support that in the Politburo was that Gorbachev wanted them there. So again, his uniqueness is the key. So the question I would ask now about Putin is, is he unique in the sense that only he in his circle would have invaded Ukraine? Up until now, I would not have thought that Putin was unique. In fact, I would have thought that from the time he took over in 2000 until this year, that he was doing what lots of other people would have done in his circle, strengthen the country, strengthen its military, rebuild the vertical, the vertical of power in Russia, uh, rebuild Russia as a great power, but do it cautiously and calculatingly. But now I begin to think he is unique. You know, would Patrushev have done this? Would, uh, I, I, I'm trying to think, Narishkin have done this? Would Medvedev have done this? I'm pretty damn sure Medvedev would not have done this, even though Medvedev turns out to be a bloodthirsty supporter of Putin. <laughs> so if Putin is unique, that tells us something, um, that there are others, maybe even in his inner circle, who regret that he did this and might at some point decide to get rid of him, to move against him. Mm, yeah, that's 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 an amazing idea. And uh, at the same time, um, there, there, uh, the same part of that question, uh, you were expecting that uh, that Putin would do what he had done. But uh, at the same time, uh, when you were writing the book about Gorbachev, uh, describing all the steps uh, of Gorbachev and all that swift collapse of the Soviet system. It looked like um, 30 years ago, there was almost no uh, powerful forces that could uh, defend the Soviet empire. Uh, there were, there were uh, no real, there was no real power. There were, uh, there were no um, huge crowds uh, uh, rallying uh, in the squares to defend the Soviet, uh, the, the Soviet Union. Uh, it looked like the collapse of the Soviet Union was, was desired by many. Uh, why all those people who are now defending the Soviet past and want, um, um, want Soviet Union back? Why uh, were they that silent 30 years ago? And how, how come they, uh, they came such a long path to, to that Russia that we have now? Well, first of all, they were not entirely silent. I'm thinking of the referendum of March 1991, which Gorbachev arranged, and it asked, I don't remember the exact wording, but it's... Yeah. The question was very tricky. The question was tricky, but nonetheless, 70% or more supported the continuation of something like the Soviet Union or a reduced Soviet Union. 
There, there, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, there was a joke among Soviet journalists that the question was like, do you want to be rich and healthy or prefer to be poor and, um, uh, and sick? Yeah, it was like majority voted for being uh, rich and healthy. Well, it's true, but how you ask the question can, of course, determine the answer. But nonetheless, that sentiment was there. Anyway, uh, why wasn't there more activity in support of that sentiment? I think Russia, Soviet Union was carried away by the excitement and enthusiasm of attempting to join what was then portrayed as the civilized world, the West. You remember the joke, another joke, that Soviet Union before the reforms was like upper Volta with rockets, mm -hmm. benighted African country, backward African country with, with missiles. I, as I recall, I, I lived in Moscow for six months in 88, and I was back in 89, 90, 91. Uh, I remember a lot of people uh, were became believers in the reform, at least in 88, maybe 89 too, as late as 80, as late as 90. In the spring of 90, Gorbachev was still the most popular politician in the Soviet Union. It was only in the fall of 90 that Yeltsin overtook him in that role. Uh, but then what happened? I guess I, I, I don't mean to, I, I don't like the notion of national character, but I think there's something about the history of Russia and the Soviet Union which prepared, which disposed the people to get carried away with the possibility of democracy and change and joining the civilized world, but then to, to lose faith too quickly, you know, to decide, no, it's not working, give it up, uh, and switch as many of the uh, Democrats did to Yeltsin, and as many of the voters did to Yeltsin. Uh, I know Gorbachev was himself worried about this, the, the tendency of Russians to try to do things too fast. Now, I don't mean to deny that conditions, living conditions, became very difficult, and people were very unhappy and had reason to be. But nonetheless, um, Russians are changeable. And uh, so maybe that means after a war in Ukraine, which seems to be a defeat, they will reassess the question of how much they support an authoritarian regime like Putin's. Yeah, but, but uh, yeah, actually, with, um, it started um, at oh, the collapse of Soviet Union. Uh, uh, it, it looked like. So the collapse of the Soviet Union was inevitable uh, after the um, failed coup of uh, um, August 19th uh, of 1991. Uh, 1991. And, yes. and the, that failed coup was because of the huge um, street protests, because the, the population of Moscow wanted democracy, not um, uh, coming back to the um, authoritarian, totalitarian state. Um, why that um, that spirit um, was was that quick to uh, to fade away? Well, first of all, the uh, the people who supported Gorbachev and Yeltsin during the coup and turned away the attempt to arrest uh, Gorbachev uh, were not in charge of the events that followed in the re remaining months of 1991. Uh, I, I paid a lot of attention to the negotiations among Gorbachev, Yeltsin, and the presidents of the other Soviet republics. And Gorbachev by this time, I don't. I think Gorbachev had been wounded psychologically by all the setbacks that he faced. And he was in those, in those meetings of the so-called state council, he was too, um, he tried to dominate, even though he no longer had the support to dominate. Yeltsin by now was resisting. 
and had decided, we don't know exactly when, but pretty early on, to get rid of Gorbachev and indeed of the Soviet Union. So I think the people who came to the defense of what was left of the Soviet Union in August were not in a position to act and preserve it later in the year. It was decided on top by mm -hmm. the leaders. You mentioned the war in Afghanistan. Uh, do you think it's fair in some way to compare that war that uh, brought Soviet Union closer to its end uh, to the current war? And um, we, we know that, that uh, um, there were no protests uh, against that war in Soviet Union because there, there could never be any public protest against any, um, anything. Uh, so, Soviet Union did. Um, and the first protests uh, started only when, when Gorbachev started Glasnost. That, that was obviously 1986. Um, yes. So can we expect that s sometime uh, there will be like popular um, protest against this war? And how how similar could uh, could be uh, the Ukrainian war to, to that Afghanistan war? Well, the wars, that war was very destructive of not only Afghanistan, but of Soviet soldiers. And there was unhappiness with it even before 1986. There were the mothers who had to cope with the zinc caskets containing the bodies of their sons. Um, but... Gorbachev didn't like the war, and there were people in the Politburo after he took over who didn't like the war. Uh, so in that sense, again, the, the impetus for ending the war came from the top. Now, in this war, first of all, there's much more publicity, not in Russia itself, because we know the media tries to obscure what's going on. But look at all these people who did try to protest and were arrested and cowed into silence. Look at the hundreds of thousands who fled to avoid the draft. That suggests that at the, le at the level of the people, there is unhappiness. Maybe not a majority, but who knows? Maybe even a silent majority. The trouble is, so far, there's no resistance at the top, like the resistance in the Politburo, um, and, but maybe that will come. I mean, I'm fascinated by the relations between Putin and his henchmen, that scene in the Kremlin, in that big, luxurious, empty hall where he sat on one side and Petrushev and, and all the others sat on the other side. And when Narishkin stuttered and bumbled answering Gorbachev's question, They've got to be unhappy, and the military's got to be unhappy because they're being blamed by many of the hardliners. So you would think that the, that the ground is being prepared for some kind of resistance to Putin, except as somebody who wrote about Khrushchev and Gorbachev, I know that the reason that Khrushchev was ousted and Gorbachev was thwarted, was that the system had built in uh, into it the capacity to resist even those leaders. Mm -hmm. That the Politburo and the Central Committee of the Communist Party had the theoretical right under the party rules to resist the leader. Now, they hadn't done it under Stalin, but they did it under Khrushchev. They ousted him twice. The first time in 1957, when the presidium voted him out, but he turned to the Central Committee and the Central Committee supported him. Mm -hmm. The second time in October 1964, when they ousted him. And in the case of Gorbachev, it wasn't the Politburo itself. It was, uh, it was the sort of security people and the Politburo and the Yazov, the defense minister, who pushed him, pushed him, and then Yeltsin and others who pushed him out. So the question is, is there an entity? And if so, what is it and where is it in the current Russian scene that might mount an open 
or resistance, or at first maybe a covert resistance to Putin. At the moment, I don't see one unless it's the military and maybe some of these longtime supporters of him in the uh, FSB and the Gay Eru. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting that both of your um, uh, heroes, uh, um, Khrushchev as well as Gorbachev, are considered to be uh, to be weak in in today's uh, vision of Russian history. And they are probably the least popular leaders because according to uh, contemporary propaganda, they are the weakest leaders. Do you consider them to be weak? And how would you, com uh, and uh, you've probably heard that uh, recently Putin was asked, uh, um, and um, the, the interviewer, Fedor Lukyanov, was, was speaking about the, the Cuban crisis. And he, he asked Putin if Putin can imagine himself um, um, doing the same things as Khrushchev did. And, uh, and Putin was uh, outraged by, by su such a question and answered that uh, under no circumstances he can imagine himself acting like Khrushchev. Well, actually, in a sense, he is acting like Khrushchev. Because uh, Ukraine, of course, is much closer <clears throat> to Russia than Cuba. Uh, sending those missiles to Cuba was a crazy idea. Uh, and maybe, well, I begin to think invading Ukraine was a crazy idea. I mean, it has certainly produced consequences, which he did not intend, unintended consequences. It looks, as I said a while ago, wild and reckless. Um, as to the weakness of Khrushchev and Gorbachev, I, you know, I, I, I of course, I'm aware of that. And it, it, it says something about Russians' mindset. I mean, was it weak of Gorbachev to decide that the whole Soviet system needed to be transformed? Was it weak of Gorbachev to maneuver his way to the top of the Communist Party? Was it weak of Gorbachev to get the other members of the Politburo who did not like the idea of transforming the Soviet Union, even though they did like the idea of moderate reforms? Was it weak of Gorbachev to get them to vote for the very transformations which they despised and detested, which they did in 1988? Uh, was it you know, as I worked on Gorbachev, I came across some of the criticism of him, of course, from Russians. I remember one that said, he, he listens. That's his problem. He listens too much. Well, in the West, we think listening is a good idea. Another one they said was, he changes his mind. Again, we think, I, don't, I shouldn't speak for the entire West, <laughs> I don't have a mandate. But nonetheless, the notion of listening and considering counter arguments and weighing the options and revising your, your own views uh, to take account of the realities that you've discovered by listening to other people, these are not weaknesses. These are strengths. Now, to be sure, in the end, he was reluctant to use force. And I've talked to people some of them close advisors to him who say that was a great weakness. I talked to one person, Karen Brutens, who was an advisor of his, who said he should have used force in the Nagorno-Karabakh war. He should have used force much earlier against <clears throat> the Pogromisti in Sumgait. Uh, if he had done that, then, then Brutens said, maybe the Baltics would have hesitated to try to break away. So he should have used force. And I can imagine somebody saying he should have used force against Yeltsin, Shushkevich, and... Um, yeah, yeah. Why didn't he use force then? Well, I guess that's a weakness if the criterion is, will you do anything to hold on to power? and he would not do anything. Um, so if it was a weakness, I persist in thinking it was a weakness that was in some ways 
a moral strength. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I know that, um, or at least it seems to me that according to your book, you consider the role of uh, President Reagan to be exaggerated. That actually uh, Gorbachev was um, was the leader, and he played the leading role in um, dismantling Soviet system or reforming the Soviet system. And um, and the role of Reagan was not that uh, that impressive and that important. Um, am I right? And what do you think about the possibilities um, to affect the, the the Russian Empire from the outside? Can can Americans or or um, um, other outsiders uh, use their influence to try to? Um, um, reform or to put pressure uh, on Russia to, to achieve some changes? Well, first of all, um, I would revise the view of Reagan that you attribute to me. It's true that when I studied and read the uh, negotiations and conversations between Reagan and Gorbachev, I was unimpressed by the way that Reagan over and over again seemed to be a kind of amateur compared to Gorbachev. He, he told stupid jokes. Uh, he seemed uninformed. Uh, but I think in the largest sense, Reagan was uh, the perfect partner for Gorbachev. I mean, that's strange in itself because here's a communist leader and an arch conservative American president. So what made Reagan the perfect partner for Gorbachev's effort to not only ease, but actually end the Cold War? I think the key was that Reagan wanted to abolish nuclear weapons. And he wanted to end the Cold War too. Uh, the, the notion of abolishing nuclear weapons, which Gorbachev shared, is not widely shared in the leadership, was not widely shared then in the leadership of either the United States or the Soviet Union. Um, it turns out, you know, what, what made Reagan seem an ogre to the Russians when he first was first elected was the Strategic Defense Initiative, mm -hmm. was the talk of Russia as Soviet Union as an evil empire. But what Reagan was trying to do was to somehow soften up the Soviets so that he could then negotiate with them and try to end the Cold War and abolish nuclear weapons. That was a key to his cooperation with Gorbachev. And by 1988, when Reagan left office, he concluded the Cold War was over. They had not abolished nuclear weapons, although they had come close to agreeing to do so at Reykjavik. But Reagan thought the basic issues were settled. Now, if that's the case, why do I think that Gorbachev was more important than Reagan? Because I asked myself the following question. If there had been no Gorbachev, if Gorbachev had been hit by a truck and killed in 1978 or something like that, uh, the Americans would have had nobody to negotiate an end to the Cold War with. I mean, who would have been the Soviet leader then, beginning in 1985? Grishin, the Moscow party chief, uh, you know, uh, Gromyko? There would have been nobody to negotiate in the way that Gorbachev negotiated. Now, change the, change the hypothesis. Let's say Reagan was killed before he took office. Who would the Soviet, whom would Gorbachev have had to negotiate? Well, let's imagine George Bush, the first, George W. Bush. Bush was in some ways more difficult than Reagan because when Reagan left office, Bush spent several months questioning whether Gorbachev was a real partner. But in the end, Bush joined Gorbachev in negotiating an end to that old Cold War. So that's my basic point. Without Gorbachev, I don't think the Cold War ends. Without Reagan, I imagine it does. Mm -hmm. um, I want you to try to compare 
the Soviet propaganda to the current Russian propaganda because it's obvious that uh, its significance and its role is enormous. Because uh, all the reforms uh, that happened in the Soviet Union in late uh, 80s were possible only because of Glasnost and on, only because uh, Gor Gor Gorbachev decided that the free press should exist in the Soviet Union. And everything uh, what's happening right now in Russia and the popularity of the war and just the idea that that war is, is possible. Um, we can thank propaganda for that. Uh, that propaganda that was planting the seeds of the war for the last 10 years. Uh, so, um, is, it, is it really um, only about the, the propaganda what, what can change uh, the potentially democratic country uh, to uh, the uh, bloodthirsty tyranny? Well, you know, I used to I used to compare Soviet propaganda with American political American politics and party line. And I used to say the Americans, like all politicians, bent the truth, said what the party needed uh, and were in that way uh, contemptible. But then I said, compared to Soviet propaganda, that was much worse because the things that Soviet propagandists said were often on their face absurd, and yet they yeah. said them anyway. Exactly, uh, exactly. They, they didn't believe. They didn't believe it. They right? were just pretending, yes. Right, right. But a couple of things happened. First of all, nowadays in America, especially on the right wing of the Republican Party, one encounters propaganda, which is absurd. You know, Biden, actually stole the election. That's absurd. Uh, so the Americans, at least to my, in my opinion, on the right wing of the Republican Party, have become as almost as bad as the Soviets used to be. But meanwhile, in Russia, Russian propaganda is now worse than the Soviets used to be. Uh, now, I don't follow it as closely as I did in the old days when I lived in the Soviet Union. But that's my impression. When you say bloodthirsty, that is a little different. You know, the Soviet propaganda used to be the Americans are, you know, they're capitalists, they're oppressors, they're imperialists, they're warmongers, they're all of these things. But, but the kind of savagery that we see in Ukraine, the bombing day after day, after hour after hour of innocent people by Soviet, by Russian soldiers who themselves are probably victims of a system which doesn't prepare them and sends them to be slaughtered themselves. This is, this is worse, uh, worse than Soviet propaganda used to be. At least that's my impression. Mm -hmm. um, what, do, what do you think about Crimea? Uh, and about the potential, uh, the, the possible scenarios of what what could happen to uh, to that peninsula, because you you've uh, you've studied uh, its history from from Khrushchev, from uh, uh, Crimea being given from Russian Federation to Ukraine, then then you uh, you know very well how it um, how Ukraine became independent and. Uh, Yeltsin didn't uh, take it from from Kravchuk. So, so what could be the the possible outcome, and what what should be the possible outcome for that? Well, first of all, I don't know as much about Crimea as I would like to know. I'm not even sure exactly why Khrushchev, about whom I wrote 700 pages, uh, gave it to Ukraine. I think it had something to do with what appeared to be the economic logic of having uh, that huge area down there uh, in the middle of, or at least geographically part of the Ukrainian space. I think it also had to do with, with Khrushchev's sense of nostalgia for Ukraine, where he had moved as a child and grown up in what was then called Stalino and then became Donetsk and where he had climbed the party ladder to the point where uh, he became a big shot. So 
I'm not entirely clear about even the origins of that initial transfer of, of Crimea. But as to what happens to it, well, this in a way takes us back to a question you asked a few minutes ago that I don't think I addressed. And that is what can the outside world do, the United States in particular, to promote somehow reform in Russia, or at least perhaps an end to this terrible war. Um, you know, I think back to the Cuban Missile Crisis. I think back to the fact that in the midst of this war, of, of this crisis, which brought the world to the brink of a nuclear confrontation, Khrushchev and Kennedy found ways to talk directly and work out a deal. Uh, and that seems to be absent at the moment in Ukraine. Putin won't talk. I don't think he'll talk seriously. And Zelensky doesn't seem to want to talk either, at least as long as his forces are doing well. But, but if there were talks, if not at their level, then lower level, what would be a basis for ending the war? Um, well, you know, again, I'm not involved. I have not been a uh, I've not been in government. I'm just a scholar and a and a writer. But it seems to me that there would have to be some kind of deal if this is not an utter defeat for either side and surrender, some kind of deal. And the the deal that looks most uh, possible or plausible would be one in which the Russians move out of the Ukrainian provinces, Donetsk, Lugansk, but perhaps maintain Crimea with some sort of uh, agreement that in some substantial period of time, there would be a vote in Crimea as to where they want, you know, supervised by the United Nations, which uh, would determine Crimea's future. Now, that may be a fantasy. It may even be a very bad idea. But it, and it might also, I guess, depending upon how that deal or one like it was perceived in Russia, it might either and in Ukraine, Ukraine. And in, and uh, Ukraine. in Ukraine, definitely, Ukrainian society today yeah, yeah, will, yeah. will not accept that deal. Well, we'll probably never accept it unless they're losing uh, in the war. Uh, but how will Russia view it? Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of, is there a deal that would end the war without Putin's being perceived as justified in having begun it? Is there a deal that would not be a totally humiliating defeat for Russia, which would somehow allow the hardline right-wingers to uh, end up on top? Now, you might say a humiliating defeat would uh, help reformers. I just don't know. This is all too, too unclear. And in fact, I probably shouldn't even speculate because I don't know enough. Mm, yeah. Um, as far as I know, your grandfather was from was born um, not far from Mykolaiv, now Ukraine. Ukraine. That's right. That's right. Uh, yeah. Um, what are your personal emotions about what's what's happening in in Ukraine right right now? And like, um, do, do do you have any special th uh, feelings about the, that that place that used to be uh, the motherland of your grandfather? Well, you know, I have I have very strong feelings. I don't think they go back to my grandfather's having come from there. They go back from they go back to the fact that I have visited Russia, Soviet Union, and Ukraine many times, maybe thirty times. My first trip was nineteen sixty four, then I spent nineteen sixty five at MGU, Moscow University, in the law school for the whole year. Uh, 10 years after Gorbachev graduated. I've been back over and over again. And Russia has been <clears throat> the center, Soviet Union first and Russia, of my intellectual life. It was the great puzzle I was trying to understand. I made some of the best friends my wife and I did. She taught Russian at Amherst for many years too. Uh, our best friends were in Russia. 
And you know now, they're all gone. They're in Europe or Tel Aviv or uh, back or in Yerevan. And in those early years, I mean, we loved Russia. We, we loved the people we met. We sympathized with them. We tried to understand them. Even the people we didn't sympathize that much with, we tried to understand. It was the great puzzle to which we devoted our life, trying to understand it. And now we don't want to go back. We can't go back. We wouldn't go back. So in a sense, it's a for us personally, which is very small item in the gloss in the losses that people are suffering in Russia and in Ukraine. But it's a loss. And we are unhappy and distressed. Mm, yeah. Uh, you know, as as a person who has left uh, Russia this February, mm, I know what you're talking about, really. Uh, okay, and this this year also uh, we had lots of bad news, including the uh, death of, of President Gorbachev. Um, I interviewed him quite a lot, as well as you did. Uh, but let's let's start with with um, with that question. How can you comment on the fact that uh, his death was that important um, news for the whole world, except for Russia? It was almost unnoticed. It was uh, almost um, not discussed by uh, by Russian society. Except, except, <clears throat> I saw the videos of the people who came to pay their respects uh, and to uh, and to you know for his when his corpse was lying in state, not at the Hall of Columns, or, but wherever it was. Um, I mean, that was in a sense the last popular demonstration of the Gorbachev era, when those few thousand people marched by his coffin. Um, let, let me, can may I say a couple of words about Gorbachev? And, yes, yes, and, please. And, yes, yes, please. Uh, when Gorbachev died, I, was, I did a series of interviews Uh, in many places around the world on press and radio and television. The most striking to me was with uh, somebody at Medusa, who was based in Riga. I think it was Kavalyov, is that right, Anatoly? Yeah, I mean, yeah, and, yeah, Alexei. Yeah. yeah, Alexei. And he started this way. He said, first of all, let me tell you that my grandparents, who were hardline communists, hated Gorbachev. And let me also tell you that my parents, who were Democrats, hated Gorbachev just as much. Why? Because he did not move fast enough and forcefully enough to democratize uh, the Soviet Union. This underlined for me the gap between the respect for Gorbachev that you referred to in much of the rest of the world and the hatred, if not well, at least ignorance or un disrespect for Gorbachev in Russia itself. So prompted by this, I sat down to reassess my own view of Gorbachev. Uh, and here's what I came up with. I came up with the idea that Gorbachev's decision to try to transform the Soviet Union, to democratize it, was not just a political decision, or an economic decision, or a foreign policy decision. It was a philosophical decision. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that he had noble goals, noble goals to transform, to democratize the Soviet Union and, and end the Cold War, but he faced incredible obstacles. The resistance of the hardliners, uh, the potential explosiveness of ethnic separatism, if Glasnost allowed people to speak up. Uh, the very history of Russia and the Soviet Union, in which there had never been a real, stable, enduring rule of law or an active civil society. Uh, so he faced these obstacles, but he also had great power as a communist leader. I talked about that earlier, about his power to get his own uh, colleagues who didn't support him to vote for his policies, despite 
their reservations. So the question then becomes, what do you do in that situation? You have these great noble goals, you have the power possibly to achieve them, and you face these huge obstacles. Um, I think he had alternatives. He could have simply presided like Brezhnev over the existing Soviet Union. And if he had, he would have lasted 10, 15 years possibly. Then maybe the Soviet Union would have exploded after he was gone. He could have tried the Chinese path, uh, you know, which was economic reform, but politically clamped down. The trouble was Russia is not China. Uh, he could have done what his main patron uh, in the Politburo, Andropov, had seemed to want to do, which was keep control for 15 years until the economy has improved, and then maybe people will accept, uh, even the hardliners will accept political reform. But he didn't do any of those. What did he do? He said it himself, we tried, we tried. That's what I'm suggesting is admirable about Gorbachev. He had these wonderful goals. He had the power to pursue them. He faced tremendous obstacles and he tried. And maybe that's what Russia needs in the aftermath of the Ukrainian war. It needs somebody who tries again. Now I can immediately hear the, the counter arguments. Well, he tried, but he failed. And look what happened afterwards. Uh, but that failure was, and you can make the case, and I, and I made it to myself, that his attempt was doomed because of the obstacles he faced and because of the mistakes he made. But I still come back to the fact that making the attempt is worth, is worth it because you may not fail, you may succeed. And if you succeed, your country benefits, your people benefit, the world benefits. Um, so that's, those are my thoughts in retrospect about Gorbachev. He tried. Uh yeah, you know, un unlike many uh, parents uh, of, of some of my friends, and un unlike most of grandparents of my friends, I do not hate Gorbachev, I admire him, but at the same time, I think that uh, probably um, his, his target, as he saw it, was, was a bit wrong. And uh, interviewing him uh, several times during the last decade, uh, I I saw that he he still regrets that that Soviet Union collapsed because he wanted Soviet Union to become the good empire. He didn't want it uh, to remain the, the evil empire, but he believed that it was still possible to make it a good empire, the the Soviet Union that would serve for the benefit of the of the Soviet people and that would be um, humane and democratic. Um, and I've got, and now, especially after that war started, uh, I've got a question for myself, and I think I've got the answer, that the, the, the biggest mistake was that belief that Soviet Union could become the good empire. Because now it seems to me that the idea of the empire is evil itself. What do you think of, 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 well, of that difference? Well, first of all, which Soviet Union? If you're imagining a Soviet Union with all of its constituent republics, including the Baltic republics, that's one thing. If you're imagining a reduced Soviet Union without the Baltics, and um, I don't know, we'd have to pick and choose in retrospect which other republics would have stayed or not stayed, but I think there's a there was a, a case of the kind that Gorbachev imagines in retrospect for a reduced Soviet Union headed by somebody like him and people like him as his successors. I mean, um, think of some of those Central Asian states now. They are 
again, I don't know enough about them really to render a verdict, but my impression is that some of them are not ideal in the way that they're governed. Uh, I think of Nazarbayev in Kazakhstan. As long as Gorbachev was around and, uh, and preaching the continuation of the Soviet Union in its reduced form, Nazarbayev was an ally. Well, what would have happened to Kazakhstan under Nazarbayev with Gorbachev still in charge of the Soviet Union? You know, I, I, I understand these are all hypotheses. These are fantasies. These are, you know, dreams. But uh, I guess what I'm imagining is a, a, a an empire, reduced empire, in which the states that are most determined to leave actually get a chance to leave. And those that are willing to stay, stay. And let's pick a really interesting case, Ukraine itself. We know that in December 1991, when the Ukrainians voted, they voted for independence. But in the referendum, which we've already talked about, and you have questioned the way it was posed in March 1991, I believe, I'd have to go back and look, but I think the Ukrainians voted to stay. Yes, they, they voted for the Soviet Union, definitely. Yes. So, so you know the phrase that... About, about, the famous, about 60 or 65 percent, yeah. You know the famous phrase, the consent of the governed, the Jeffersonian American phrase, that the, the consent of the governed is required for a government to be legitimate. Well, the Ukrainians changed their consent. They gave it in March 1961, 1991, and they took it away in December. So, and the uh, reason was, uh, or at least it considered to be, uh, to be the reason, the coup, August 19th. Yes, yes. Gorbachev came back from uh, Foros in August to uh, preside over the ratification of the new Union Treaty. Um, I mean, as we have discovered, not not just or not only in the former Soviet Union, but in many places around the world, nationalism, ethnic nationalism, rather than secular nationalism, can be a highly destructive force. So I think we should not assume that any time people want to break away and govern themselves, that that is going to end up as a positive good, uh, as opposed to a situation in which they want to remain associated with their former empire. I mean, for many years, I mean, India and Pakistan did get their independence and they slaughtered each other horribly in fighting over where they would end up in 1948. But then for many years under Nehru and his followers, India remained uh, uh, not part of the British empire, but of the, of the British Commonwealth in a way that was quite humane. So I guess I'm wondering whether a Soviet reduced Soviet Union pro governed with the consent of its people uh, and with leaders like Gorbachev in charge might have evolved toward a real commonwealth rather than the commonwealth of independent states, which supposedly replaced the Soviet Union and didn't amount to anything real. Yeah, that's... Um... I think that's uh, that's that's the position that would spark uh, the huge outrage in Ukraine yes, right, yes, right yes, now. Yes, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yes, I, I'm 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 being a uh, uh, I'm saying a scholar. I'm I'm, I'm being a uh, I'm just trying to imagine alternate futures. Mm -hmm. The better to evaluate the future that we actually have inherited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, but unfortunately, like for 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 almost three decades, we were for, for three decades. Yes, uh, we were we. I mean, the scholars and the the politicians as well, and the the journalists uh, praised uh, Soviet leaders and Gorbachev for bloodless uh, collapse of the Soviet Union. Now we see that that now it's not bloodless, and uh, now we we. Do we have to reevaluate uh, that beginning 
knowing uh, its horrible end. Well, can I go back once more to leaders and their personalities, including Gorbachev? Uh, sorry, that's my that's my phone. I'm going to somehow turn it off. Uh, um, leaders and their personalities, as I said. You know, it's interesting. The Soviet Union, un with its Marxist ideology, preached the relative unimportance of leaders. That is, Marxism does. Marxism talks about vast, impersonal forces. But look at the Soviet Union. Without Lenin, I don't think there would have been a Bolshevik revolution. Without Stalin, well, there might have been terrible cruelty, collectivization, but the terror, the purges, I think are a product of Stalin's character, particularly. Without Khrushchev, no denunciation of Stalin, no Cuban Missile Crisis. Without Gorbachev, no attempt to democratize the Soviet Union. So we have the crucial importance of leaders and their personalities. And I wonder, again, I don't, I don't uh, proclaim this, I don't declare it, but I wonder to what extent this terrible war in Ukraine is a product of Putin's personality. I know there are many other factors. I know that NATO expanded and that there are people who say it threatened Russian security. I know that there is this dream of a Russian empire, including U Ukraine. Uh, I know there are forces in Russia that support the invasion. But I wonder going back, I, I went back myself and took a look at Putin's biography, especially in those early years. Whoops, sorry. Uh, uh, I know there, in Putin's early years, he was growing up, he was a kid, he was a brawler who liked to fight. And I read the testimony of his friends who said that when he fought, he fought with his fists, he fought with his teeth, he tore out the hair of his, of the people he was fighting. And when he learned martial arts, he could take on bigger people. And the one thing he would refuse to do was to lose. And his teacher said, Volodya will never forgive somebody who is mean to him or betrays him. So what I'm wondering is how much of this unique character of this Russian leader explains the behavior of Russia in invading Ukraine. I'm sure this is too narrow. This is too simple, probably. But it's the kind of thing that interests me as a biographer, mm -hmm. trying to understand leaders and why they behave the way they do and why they can somehow have a decisive impact on their country. It's tragic that that uh, several countries can can become hostages of uh, uh, of one single person with uh, with traumas, as you've just described. Um, absolutely, absolutely. That, but that's that's one. That's the great danger, perhaps the greatest danger of a single uh, authoritarian or totalitarian leader, that the obstacles uh, are not there to stopping him. In the United States, you know, we don't know what Trump would have done if he were free to do what he wanted, but so far he has been contained and constrained by the press, by the Congress, by the states, by the voters. It's too soon to say his story is over, uh, but those, those very obstacles that have constrained Trump also have prevented the United States from often acting to do what it needs to do, because the obstacles that can contain a dictator can also prevent a country from, from moving forward and doing the right thing. So there's a trade-off. And I guess it's possible, you could say that a dictator can sometimes choose to do something that the country needs. Although I have trouble imagining exactly a case that would fit that description. But on, on the in the end, better the stalemate that comes with a democracy uh, than the possibility of decisive action that comes with a dictator. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. That was very... Sure.
Fascinating inter interview. You're very welcome. I enjoyed responding to your questions, your very good questions. Thank you. Bye-bye.